Thanks everyone for coming today. My name is Lifa. Um, I work for the RIBA. I am the director for the Northern Regions. So welcome today and thank you for attending our CIOB, RIBA, ICS and RTPI Joint Labour Party Conference Fringe event. Development creates and recreates communities across the UK, providing shelter and security and enables access to work, public services and community spaces. But our housing crisis shows that people's needs are not always reflected in decisions and delivery. So from housing affordability and quality to retrofitting infrastructure to placemaking, this evening we are joined today by built environment experts to share their vision on how communities can maximize the long-term benefits of development. The discussion will examine key issues, including regional and socioeconomic inequality, inclusive design um, and development, ongoing building and planning reform, and climate change resilience. We are delighted tonight to be joined by Rebecca Long Bailey. She is the MP for Southford and Echoes. She was first elected in 2015. Rebecca has been the Shadow Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industry Strategy, setting out labor policies on how to rebuild our communities and transform the country's energy system so that it places communities um, and the environment at its core. Most recently, she served as Secretary of State for Education. Rebecca, welcome. We've also got Paul Bennett, he is the city mayor of Salford, city council. And since becoming city mayor, Paul has emphasized the importance of housing, jobs, and equalities, and has overseen Greater Manchester's housing strategy, infrastructure strategy, and plan for homes, jobs, and the environment. We have Simon Orford. He is the president of the RIBA and founding director of Orford Hall, Monaghan Morris. It's best known as AHMM. He is a frequent writer, critic and advisor, and visiting professor at Harvard. He is currently leading a series of large-scale urban research and design projects in London, the UK, Europe, India, and the US. We've got Craig, Craig Batty, a trustee of CIOB. Craig has led uh, substantial multidisciplinary collaborative work, winning teams across a mixture of design and build partnering and competitive projects across a wide range of private and public sector clients. We've got uh, Wei Yang, immediate past president at RTPI, and she's the chair of Wei Yang and Partners, an award-winning master planning firm in London. She is a lead figure in researching, promoting, and implementing 21st century garden city and green and low carbon development approach worldwide. I have some questions for the panel, but there will be time to take questions from the audience. But first, um, I'm going to ask our first speaker and ask them to tell us in maybe two or three minutes and just for them to address what they think sustainable development looks like. So we are actually going to start with you, Rebecca. <laughs> no pressure there. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks very much. Um, well, I'm certainly not uh, an expert on the built environment like all of the other panellists that we've got here today. I am a ex-commercial property lawyer turned um, socialist who became an MP and then became interested in how we can make our um, spaces and homes uh, carbon neutral and more sustainable. And over the last few years, certainly, we faced new and worsening crises. There's been the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the major changes in social care, and an ever-deepening energy and cost of living crisis. And of course, there's the climate crisis that we know that if we don't address it, we simply won't have a planet left to live on in 50 to 100 years time. So we have to tackle these crises. And one of the things that certainly struck me and others within the Labour Party a few years ago is that, yes, we've got to tackle the crisis, but in doing so, it's actually providing us with the biggest economic lever we've ever had. 
to completely reinvigorate parts of our industry across the country and gear them up to developing new skills and new industries to decarbonise our homes, industries and transport, for example. Now, we can ensure that we've got universal rollout of sustainable homes um, alongside a substantial change to our energy system. And the government's current target simply isn't good enough. We, they want to reach net zero by 2030. Now, many scientists across the world have said that that is too late and we need to have the majority of our decarbonisation actions taken before 2030. And that's why it's so important for all governments across the world to have sustainability and tackling climate change at the heart of every single economic and industrial policy that they make. Now, the government's strategy on sustainable homes, well, I mean, there's a lot of people probably have a lot of opinions on this um, in the room, but certainly to my mind, it's pretty much non-existent at the moment. Um, we heard policies like the Green Homes Grant, for example, announced only to be removed very quickly before anybody could actually apply for them. Um, they priced many people out of being able to be part of that sustainability vision. So if you had the money to install solar panels or insulation in your home, then that was great. But if you didn't, if you were poor or you didn't meet the threshold for a Green Homes Grant, then you were never going to have a retrofitted home. And that is certainly not a strategy that we can take if we're planning to make all homes sustainable by at least 2030. Now, the Labour Party set out quite a bold vision um, in the 2019 manifesto. There was that much of it to read, you'd probably fall asleep, but if you're bored tonight, um, please Google uh, 30 by 2030, and it was our kind of general... It was mainly focused around energy because that was the main thing that I was concentrating on at that particular time, but it delved into the world of... Um, retrofitting and how we could deal with our current housing stock, when many of which um, don't meet uh, sustainable thresholds at the moment. And it was very, very radical. Um, it looked at retrofitting millions of homes by fixed dates. It looked at introducing a range of industrial measures to decarbonise not just transport, but elements of industry as well, because I think it's important to talk about what is a sustainable home? It's not just about having a home that meets a certain energy criteria or energy rating. It's not just about making sure that it's a properly insulated home. It's about making sure that all of the materials that you've got that build that home or that building are actually as carbon neutral as they possibly can be as well. And so far, industry has not received enough support to be able to do that all the way through from the concrete industry through to the steel industry, you name it. They're not receiving enough support from government to invest in the research and development to decarbonise their current production processes. And there is research happening out there, by the way. So another hat that I wear is a member of the Science and Technology Committee. <coughs> and not so long ago, we were talking to some fantastic scientists who had already done some work into the decarbonisation of concrete, for example, but they were saying that they hadn't received enough support from government. So I could talk about this for hours, but I'll just close on this, is that we've got to remember that sustainability and sustainable homes isn't just about tackling the construction of those homes. It's about every single process along the way. And that means that we've got to have a real and detailed industrial strategy. And we have to have public investment to back up that strategy to crowd in the private investment. At the moment, globally, we're aiming for 2.5% of our GDP being spent on research and development. All the leading industrial nations are spending at least 3% of their GDP. So that shows that our ambition in just research and development isn't good enough. Um, so that's all I wanted to start with. Thank you very much for having me on the panel. I hope we have a fantastic discussion today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you, Paul, next. OK. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Um, I think, for me, talking about sustainable development, we need to first focus on the word sustainable, because I think it's very easy to kind of collapse this debate into thinking about environment, how we tackle climate change. For me, sustainability is triple bottom line. It's looking at the economy, it's looking at society and people, and it is also looking at environmental sustainability. So currently we know sustainable development is defined by predominantly what is possible 
for developers. And when I say developers, I'm talking predominantly about developers operating within the private sector, providing new builds and completions up and down the country. What we know, certainly, when we look at the new housing supply coming through planning systems, is a lot of it tends to be unaffordable. Certainly unaffordable for many people on my housing waiting list in the city of Salford, or people living in temporary accommodation. And also what we know is from the supply data, a lot of this is pushing the growth of the private rented sector. So increasingly, people are being pushed into the private rented sector, not because there's a choice in the housing market, but out of necessity to ensure that they have a roof over their heads. What we also know is that developers consciously don't build beyond something called the absorption rate. And we know that just by looking at planning permissions that have been granted and not built out. Why do they do this? Well, they do this because they're looking at the impact of supply on property prices. And the last thing they want to happen is for property prices to slump as they increase supply. So it's not uncommon <coughs> for developers to ultimately stagger development within our economy. And collectively, what does this mean about this sector of the economy? Well, it means that we don't really have that much competition in a sort of traditional sense between you know, the, the kind of volume builders, if you like. Um, we know from data that probably over 50% of the homes actually produced in the UK are produced through volume builders. And we also know that non-volume developers have massively reduced in terms of their supply of housing. Just looking at data from 1995, 40% of homes were built by non-volume developers back then. And up until 2021, I think it was the Federation of Master Builders, said it's down as low as 12%. So we don't really have a properly functioning market here when it comes to actually development within the UK. What we also know is the price of land is a huge factor which is having an impact on property prices and affordability. We know land is scarce and inevitably it is having an inflationary impact as a consequence of that. The banking system as well, mass mortgages, is also pushing up property prices, land prices. And increasingly what we've seen within the UK is the advent of international capital, so global capital coming into our housing market, inevitably driving up prices. So the reason I highlight all of this is because I think it raises a really interesting question about well, what do we mean by sustainability? Sustainable for who? Because developers are acquiring land, they're building properties, they're then getting into this messy territory of viability and the impact that, that then has on Section 106 agreements, community infrastructure levies, contributions to infrastructure. And then when we look at how the Treasury behave around all of this with the Green Book appraisal, the infatuation that the Treasury have with land value uplift when it's parting with cash centrally. All of this, I think, raises some really interesting questions about sustainability. Sustainable for who, is what I would ask. What we know is prior to 1979, councils provided almost 50% of all new build properties in the UK. The council's homes were revenue generating, so they helped with the council's finances, but they're also revenue saving. So I'm talking about all the work around tackling homelessness, rough sleeping, supported accommodation, and building homes for councils was the entire point of housing delivery. And obviously their loss through right to buy and councils not building anymore has been disastrous, I would say, and has been a key contributor to what we often talk about in terms of the housing and homelessness crisis in this country. Now, obviously, environmental sustainability is part of what we're talking about today. So our push to carbon neutrality, net zero carbon homes, very important. The biggest challenges around some of that are the skills shortages within the construction industry. We have an aging workforce. The nature of that industry is changing with the advent of modern methods of construction, <coughs> modular homes. What are we doing to actually link our education and economic policy to actually tackle some of these issues? I think we've had a decade or more of ineffective workforce planning, and actually that's a real challenge for how we deliver on this agenda moving forward. Mark Farmer also talks about the lack of vertical integration within the construction sector. Delayering some of those intermediaries will help improve productivity and drive out some of those inefficiencies. 
And obviously, there's the financial barriers to retrofitting itself. People are asset rich, cash poor. How do we actually retrofit the homes of the future? For me, sustainable construction is about delivering net zero carbon. It is about retrofitting our homes, but it's also about being socially cohesive in terms of architecture, design, public transport, active travel, connectivity to place, nature and public realm. And for me, if we're serious about sustainable development, we have to get serious about the state actually building council housing again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wei, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to come to you now. Thank you. Jump in the queue. I thought that was the last. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, our question is what um, sustainable development look like. I think actually we could also ask a question in another way. What sustainable development feels like? Because um, I think if we think from a uh, user's uh, community's perspective, I think a uh, sustainable community need to feel um, happy, healthy, and also environmental friend friendly as well. So in terms of happiness, because I think actually sometimes we think what is happiness? Normally there's an old Chinese saying is uh, when you think about very complicated issues, actually uh, ultimate truth is always simple. There was a very interesting study carried out by Harvard University and they took the study for almost eight decades. So they, they followed a group of youngsters from when they were very young. The research was carried out through their life, compared two groups from very different social background. And actually, they realized there was no fundamental difference between people come from different backgrounds. What's not the power and the money make you happy? It's the social relationship make you happy. So I think a sustainable community, we ultimately need a sense of community. So you can feel you are part of a society, and when you need the help, there is somebody to help you, and you can contribute the best of yourself to the community as well. So in living this kind of community, and you don't have so many material desire, so you could really enjoy your daily life, and you can work to your neighborhood, and then you can have a local accessible job, and also you can enjoy <coughs> the food produced surrounding you local food production, and you can be part of your society. So actually, ultimately, you feel happy, and then you, have, you would consume much less. And then secondly, a healthy uh, population is the best asset of any country. So really, how to create a healthy community? I think <coughs> I'll... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I assume you might be healthy community. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say to be a happy or healthy community. <laughs> sorry, Ray. <laughs> yeah, so actually um, our living environment is a key determinant of a house, of our um, a part of our uh, social determinants of our house. So our living environment play a key part of that. And then thirdly is how we can create an environmental friendly place. It relates to our day-to-day um, -day life. For example, back to what we consume um, in our daily life. Last year, as the president, I visited an um, apple farm. Actually, I learned a lot about agriculture. For example, using apple as an example, in each apple, there is 80% of apple is actually water. So if we consume an uh, apple imported from another country, you actually just, uh, or you're just importing water from another country. For example, like pink lady cannot grow in the UK. So whichever pink lady you get normally is from Australia. Actually, in a country, they need more water. Actually, we are importing water from them. Same for avocado and all sorts of other things we, we, we presume are uh, sustainable and good for you. So I think there was whole lifestyle change need to be considered when we consider environmental friendly. It's also about our lifestyle. And planning plays a key role in that because if we can plan a sustainable development, we could travel less, we could enjoy much more of our local produced food. This morning when I had my breakfast, I, had, um, uh, I, had, um, I was eating one of the tomatoes. Uh, I think it that doesn't taste like a tomato at all. Because I remember when I was small, I grew up in Beijing. In springtime, I really look forward for when tomato uh, come to the market because it's so freshly taste. But now they taste tasteless. So really, we need to rethink about actually how we want to define our life and what sustainable life is like. I think that's very much is a core part of our value 
of how we want to define and how we want to feel to live in a sustainable development. And the left back actually to your comments about another question is really if we want to achieve a sustainable development, what kind of skills we need in our built environment industry? The, the professional institute was uh, formed for a reason more than 100 years ago, most of them. And now professional boundaries are merging. So what joins us together is our shared sense of purpose. What can be done now to make our world a better place? I think that's a fundamental question we need to ask what we need to do collectively and how we can engage with the community and engage with politicians to make sure actually we have a we can create a shared vision on that. So this is my initial thought on what a sustainable development should like. I think we could really go beyond the physical part. Think about actually what how we can create a balanced system for people, nature and society to coexist in harmony. Because no matter how great we want our building look like, of course we need beauty. But fundamentally it's about our survival, it's about humanity, it's about how we position our community into the global picture. It's how we can contribute back to that global picture. So we all very small part, but we all contribute to that global picture. So I think we need to really think about what we mean by sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Wei. I'm going to come to you, Craig, and then uh, last but not least, I'll go to Simon. Yeah, sustainable development and, and what it was. And we started to look at the, the elements and, you know, everybody has, has already touched on these major points, but I think one element that comes across from the word sustainable, it's got to be a legacy driven development. It's something about every single thing that we do in creating, whether it's homes or creating infrastructure, it's the legacy that that project or programme or suite of projects can, can have in that area, in that region and, and pick up, you know, the, the, the different elements that have all been discussed on. So, for example, you know, people, um, uh, any new development has the potential not only to upscale, to, to train, to, to broaden apprenticeships and give opportunities to, to people over a longer period of time, particularly if uh, developments can be grouped, uh, those can have a lasting legacy. And personally, you know, from delivering these types of schemes, I have seen those impacts. Um, and, and 10 years later, I continue to see those impacts. So it's, it can be done and it can be quite powerful. Um, it creates jobs. In the first instance, it does create jobs. And those jobs can go on and careers can be developed and social mobility can really happen, you know, you can, you can take an apprentice and 10, 15 years later, they can be in the managerial position, bringing the next generation through. So those legacy aspects around sustainable development feeding through. Um, I think the environment is, is it's obvious, you know, the, the carbon reduction is, is so important now. And it, it is interesting, I've been involved in the, carb, uh, the concrete, <laughs> Uh, CO2 reduction and it's it's amazing just how much can be achieved with with a little bit of effort and and that's that's probably the problem it is a little bit too 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 little I think if there was some greater focus on R and D um, you know the industry would make great great leaps in in that area um, the environment there's a there's a huge housing stock out there a lot that's that's actually vacant and empty not fit for, fit for purpose, yet it sits within areas where it can be regenerated. And you have to think a lot of the housing stock that still exists in this country, you know, a good 40% is pre-war uh, and continues, and they're not very energy efficient. And there's a huge retrofitting program that must get underway uh, to, to tackle the things that Rebecca was talking about, you know, the, the net zero carbon by 2030, there's got to be major improvements by there. But again, the legacy of that program of work um, can be can be so vast in training, in upskilling, in, in not only achieving those carbon reduction targets, but a, a greater uh, economic outlook for people and for tenants and for homeowners, but also a full industry that can be mobilised um, and new skills that can move into this area, which is going to be so important in the next 20, 30 years. The green economy has got the potential to be such an employer um, and an innovative employer in, in that state. Um, 
but the, econ the, the economy side of it, creating the right places for people. Um, we've, we've all re experienced recently being stuck in those homes probably for a lot longer than we hoped. And it's only when you're there that you understand that they're not quite, you know, things that were 10, 15, designed 10, 15, 20 years ago are no longer fit for purpose. With a change in society, the way that we're working, um, the focus on health and well-being of people, uh, green spaces, living in and around green spaces, having areas where you can exercise and you can go for a walk and, and, and escape. Um, these, these are key areas now where design and, and, and that focus needs to be looked upon, not just in uh, new stock that's produced, but also existing areas and how they can be developed further. Um, all to, to leave a, a healthier society, a happier society. So for me, you know, sustainable uh, development has always got to have that legacy side of it. What, what do we leave after we've touched it? Thank you. Simon? It's all been said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of it shortens my, 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 my kind of uh, piece. I don't disagree with anything anyone said, although I would say 2030 net zero carbon is an incredibly ambitious yeah. and difficult thing to achieve. And all our work is suggesting that, you know, it's going to be hellishly difficult to get anywhere close to it, let alone get there before, because of the timelines. And that kind of brings up this issue of time for all of us, in that you know, we need to solve immediate problems, but we also need to look at the long term. And that's really difficult. So immediate problems, we talk about housing stock and numbers, but actually the long term, how we live, you know, is changing, it has continued to change, and the social structures have changed. So maybe, you know, that's where I think the tension for all of us who are thinking about, you know, projects in the future, and that, you know, government projects have a big influence, obviously, in the bigger strategic vision, and then all the local plans that feed into that. And that, to me, is, is the biggest tension in making a sustainable, you know, uh, future. What does sustainable look like? I wouldn't disagree. It's about places where people can work, live, learn, and play. It's about mixed communities. It's about you know places that bring people together, which is kind of happy and easy to say, but rather difficult to achieve. What might it look like? It might look like the city of Liverpool that I've just walked through, or it might look like the journey I've taken from London to Liverpool, where I've used the train, I've been connected to broadband, I've come to the city, I've met a number of people, some of whom have only met each other in a you know, a, a post-COVID world on a screen, and all these kinds of things. So sustainable development, to me, is, you know, it, it is the driving project. Carbon is part of that, but the driving project is to create more, you know, equitable, um, tolerant communities of discourse where different ideas and innovations and, you know, iterations are allowed to... Um, develop and play off against each other. But we're on a massive learning curve. And our problem is the built environment. This is a, you know, a fairly ancient city. It's not about building new cities. It's about thinking of what we've got, what works. A small island that we happen to be in where a culture of staying where you've come from is much stronger than it might be in somewhere like America. Therefore, we've got to build on that. Therefore, to make a city like this sustainable, you've got to look at its infrastructure. You've got to look at employment regimes. You've got to look at how you create a bigger metropolitan Liverpool that can kind of draw in the diversity of communities and industries that might make it work. So it's a kind of huge design project. And I say design not as we make buildings, but for all of us to be thinking continuously about how we create infrastructures, which might be the infrastructure of road and rail, it might be the infrastructure of broadband, it might be the infrastructure of learning, the infrastructure of accessible, um, you know, career paths into the kind of you know the diverse world. We happen to be particularly interested in the built environment. I happen to be kind of committed to, to working in that environment, and so it, maybe it's arrogant, but I do think it's actually probably has the greatest effect on most people's lives, and therefore it's a great project. The post-COVID low carbon future is an incredible design challenge, as you said. We've got to embrace that design challenge, but also get quite specific. And we've got to tie up national strategies with local strategies so that we, you know, we have a much more fluid idea and use the kind of disruption of COVID, 
to allow us to think differently about how we build this new sustainable future. So to me, the future is kind of built out of the past. It's built out of the history of places, the history of people coming together, the history of existing communities. Building new communities is really, really difficult. Um, and the greatest destruction of redevelopment is you destroy existing communities. So we need to kind of, at all levels, look at how we can use the infrastructure of design, the infrastructure of services, the infrastructure of uh, public life and public space to bring people together and find their shared common ground. And that, to me, is really important. And I've got to also say, we are going to make a lot of mistakes along the way, which is why I'm supportive of local differences and tensions and discourse, not just because you're engaging with different communities and different histories and different you know, uh, demographics, but actually, if we don't kind of continuously find out what's working, what isn't working, and, and the danger of all industries, but you know, our industry is one, is you celebrate every project as a kind of success story. Actually, what you're going to say is, this project is working for people, it's doing good things. However, this is where it isn't working, because we've got to learn really, really quickly. That's a real challenge for us. We've got to learn really, really quickly. Um, and remember that places fail not just because of the you know, fit failing physical infrastructure, which is vital, but they fail because of global, you know, this is a wind city built around trade. The wind, when I came, was kind of almost blew me off my feet. But th yeah, that's what it's built around, and some of that trade's gone. So how does this city revitalise itself? I don't think this, city's, this particular city we're in is about building more new homes. It's about using what we've got. We've got a lot of building stock. We've got to use that in an intelligent way and rebuild upon history and the embodied carbon and think quite differently about the future. As an optimist, I think it's really, really exciting, but it's, it's a kind of massive problem and we've got to kind of link up these kind of key infrastructure of people movement, uh, communication and education. And in a sense, as a small physical entity, you know, the UK, actually, how those can actually allow us to rebuild what we've got and the strengths of what we've got and build on the history of people coming together. Thank you, Simon. Um, so before we go to the audience, I just have a few other questions for the, um, for the panel, please, if you will. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Rebecca, because I think you've been quiet for too long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how, <laughs> how does the Labour Party intend to deliver defined, decent uh, standard of living for all citizens? And how does it guarantee affordable housing and energy costs for its citizens? Well, if I answer that in full, <laughs> we'll be here for the next five hours. So I'll just uh, I'll touch on one tiny aspect of it. So in terms of what we've said about um, sustainable homes in themselves, so there was the work that we did in the 2019 manifesto, which was quite detailed. And obviously then we had a new starting point then with the new leadership and we've made some new announcements um, about some of the energy policies that we're going to roll out. Now, there will be a lot more to come, I hope, and that is the whole point of conference. So I'll just outline what we've heard so far. So essentially, we've um, made a promise to insulate 19 million homes in a decade, to cut gas imports by 15% and cut bills by up to £400. We're going to double um, onshore wind capacity by 2030, increase offshore wind capacity by 2035, triple solar power by 2030, back tidal power and further investment in hydrogen and end the delay on nuclear power. Now that's, they're just big headline things and the next question is, well, that's all well and good, but where's the detail? Now, that's where I hope we'll start fleshing out some of the details. So for example, in terms of insulating homes, that's great, but as I mentioned when I did my opening comments, there's currently a poverty premium when it comes to addressing climate change. If you've got a lot of money, then you can buy an electric car, you can get home insulation and put solar panels on your roof. But if you've not got much money, you can't do those things. And one of the things that certainly myself and others wanted to do in the last manifesto was say, look, we've all got to do this. It's going to create loads of jobs, loads of industry and lots of community wealth. But for in order for people to actually enjoy that, 
we've got to make sure that whatever your income you can actually have that work done on your home so there has to be a system of grants for people who can't afford to um, insulate their own homes we looked at interest-free loans for those on <coughs> higher incomes for energy retrofit so for example replacing your boiler with a heat pump or getting solar panels installed that was even easier to finance when we looked at it because when you kind of included our energy sector and brought it into public ownership it gave us the possibility of then saying that, well yes people who can't afford um, to have solar panels or new heat pumps or new boilers in their homes right they can get a grant and it can be put straight into their homes other people on higher incomes, they won't actually have to take out a loan or a grant to pay for that. But the fact that their bill will be reduced as a result of all of the work that they're having done on their houses gives us the opportunity to add a slight amount onto their bill. But they still won't see a higher bill because they'll have a cheaper bill than they would before. But we needed to be able to bring energy into public ownership to do that so that we had the vehicle and the infrastructure to roll that out. So there are a couple of examples of things that um, needed to happen. Another thing that I think it's important to touch on is industry and I mentioned this earlier on in my comments is that you can't just look at sustainability within homes you've got to look at every single part of the process and at the moment there are so many fantastic things out there being researched and developed from carbon capture storage which could decarbonize whole industries there's a hydrogen strategy that the government talks about a lot but hasn't really delivered much on uh, apart from a few pilot schemes in certain parts of the country. Again, that can be used to decarbonise huge parts of the building industry and the processes that we use to get many of the materials that are used in buildings but isn't really being prioritised at the moment. And that requires huge government impetus. You've got to put public money on the table, but when you put that public money on the table, it gives businesses the confidence then to invest because they can see that the government has set a direction and said, yes, right, we're going to use hydrogen and CCS to decarbonise steel, to decarbonise concrete, to decarbonise all these other industries. And at the moment, I think... There's a fear from me and certainly other policymakers that the government's just expecting things to magically happen, that the market will sort itself out. But you can't have that. You've got to have the state and um, enterprise working together in partnership. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to you, Paul, next. Um, so what resources are required to ensure that local authorities have the capacity to deliver for their communities uh, in terms of housing and infrastructure? Well, where do I begin? So my, my council, um, certainly since 2010-11, has seen £232 million pounds taken out of its revenue budget, <coughs> cuts to the revenue support grant and unfunded budget pressures. 53% of core funding from central government has been taken out of the city. And, you know, if we didn't have growth in the city of Salford, <coughs> we wouldn't be able to capitalise salaries to ensure that there is a resource within the local authority to do all of the work required to deliver on this agenda, be that regulatory services in terms of tackling poor standards in the private rented sector, property services, regeneration, planning, you know, the list goes on. So I think for me, in all of this, the actual agency of local government is absolutely paramount. We can forget sustainable development if we're not serious about properly funding local government. Um, and, and I don't just say that as a leader of a council, but I say that because I see the work happening day in, day out, working with private sector partners, doing the joint master planning, developing those relationships, building trust, working through tricky situations to get development on the ground in, in our city. And, you know, local government workers are there at the helm and they're at the heart of all of that. So properly resourcing that is absolutely critical. I mean, what we've seen from national government since 2010-11 is meddling with local government financing. You know, we had the previous chancellor gloating about how he was manipulating methodologies in the treasury to skew money into shires in the south of the country. This is pretty disgraceful stuff. You know, you'll remember the sweetheart deals on social care for Surrey County Council, the transaction cost funding. Yeah, I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to local government financing. But it's really, really important. And what we need is a, a fair level playing field that takes issues such as poverty and inequality seriously when it comes to the allocation of resources into local government. 
Otherwise, what's levelling up all about at the end of the day if we're not properly resourcing councils to address issues of poverty and inequality? And I say that as a post-industrial part of the country. You know, when we transitioned from an industrial-based economy to a service economy, what did we do? We put all our eggs in one basket into financial institutions and the City of London being our economic driver. Well, we need to recalibrate that. And one of the ways we do that is through local government financing. So absolutely, replenishing lost resources in local government, because we have been the front line over many, many years, setting balanced budgets, you know, putting central government to shame. Sorry, Becky, but you know, <laughs> local government is, is certainly where it's at for me. And the sooner Westminster and Whitehall realizes the actual value of local government, then the better for this country as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the audience now and ask if we have any, any, oh, wow, okay. We've got quite a few, <laughs> quite a few. Can we have the roving mic at the front? Hello, thank you. Uh, uh, just as a disclaimer, I work with Paul in Greater Manchester, so <laughs> I, work with, I work for Paul. Um, uh, but yeah, I think uh, we're just in terms of inverting the question about what is it sustainable development on his head, I think it's a difficult question to sort of grapple with, but I think it might help us to start thinking about what sustainable development isn't. And I think what's clear, what's becoming clearer and clearer, is that it's not sustainable development to see the construction industry as an opportunity, primarily for international investment, uh, to come in and make a quick buck. It's not sustainable for us to see uh, the construction industry as a network of different private industries competing against one another within that market to just make money. It's got to be a connected system in which all of the players see themselves as part of a whole, working towards socially defined goals, in this instance, environmental sustainability, or making sure there's still enough workforce to continue. Because at the moment, I think that fragmentation within the construction sector, and within the entire development industry itself, it's clearly falling apart. There is no skills strategy. We've got a complete shortage of all the construction workers, with a shortage of skills that we need. And that feeds into so many other problems. So one brief question I was going to put with, with regards to Becky in terms of some of the grant funding, because I completely agree, one of the biggest problems we've got in terms of retrofit is the vast majority of homes are in private ownership, and it's going to ultimately come down to a, that, that person, the owner of that home, to either consent or be able to afford to put in the measures to do so. Well, we've got a bit of a bind, I think, exemplified by what happened recently in Greater Manchester with the clean air zone. Uh, uh, so basically grant was provided for people to upgrade their vehicles to the new uh, vehicles, but there weren't enough vehicles, so the grant just inflated the cost of the existing uh, stock to the point where nobody could afford it. And I think that we've got a risk here at the moment as well, that the, the sustainable retrofit sector is so underdeveloped right now that pumping money into grants at the moment is just going to inflate the price of the existing services. So there's this really difficult calibrated sort of dance we've got to do with raising up industry and the capacity of the industry and the services at an equitable rate so that those grants which are also going in, it's a very difficult task and the pessimist in me didn't I'm hugely confident we're going to manage it, but that's <laughs> <laughs> my point. Thank you. Do you want me to come back on that point? Do you want to go on that question? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think it's an interesting point to make. I think the, the well, I think it's to be clear, there are no grants at the minute, so I mean, we, we don't have any opportunity to get retrofitting if you can't afford it full stop at the minute. So I think that point needs to be made. Um, but you can't expect people who can't afford to have retrofitting done to miss out on this and live in cold homes because then they pay a poverty premium on their energy prices because they're still going to end up paying vastly exorbitant energy costs compared to everyone else who's managed to have the luxury of having that retrofit work done. So I think it's important that you see this as a universal government-led service. Now, of course, you have like industry that you partner with to deliver that service and you have to develop a skill strategy to sit alongside it. But it has to be seen as a universal thing because if we are going to be within any chance of meeting any kind of a goal by 2030 or indeed 2050, it has to be seen as a universal thing and not a luxury. And that's what really annoys me at the moment when we're tackling climate change is that it's very much seen as a luxury that you opt in as an individual to have a nice electric car. You opt in as an individual to buy fair trade 
goods that haven't been flown halfway across the world that are organic and all the rest of it. And that's not right. Everything should be focused around the climate agenda and it should be affordable for everyone. Thank you. What we're going to do, um, sorry, wait, in a minute, we're just going to get maybe two or three questions and then we can point them back because uh, just in the interest of time, uh, you can go ahead and wait while the mic is moving. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Barnabas Paul, the Liverpool School of Architecture. Uh, lots of sympathetic aspirations today. Uh, the carbon reduction without which social and economic sustainability are completely impossible, of course, uh, isn't to me convincing so far on the, on the level of detail that I've heard. Uh, I'm not hearing mechanisms for such a radical change. It's currently 39% of the world's carbon emissions for the, the built environment needs to drop to zero. Uh, cement's 8%, steel's another 8%, steel just for architecture. Uh, they are not actually showing meaningful signs of decarbonizing on the timescale required. We've got to get away from them. Uh, personal action is dwarfed by architectural contributions. So if m and replaces its Oxford Street store as they're planning to, they'll emit 40,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's 400,000 years of cold showers to save the same amount of carbon dioxide. Personal action is completely ineffective without massive change to our architectural sector. So what do the panel think we need to accept in the way of reductions in comfort conditions, reductions in developer profit, reductions in institutional expansion, or reductions in other fossil fuel luxuries that we currently accept as the norm? Sorry to ask a, a difficult and disagreeable question. Uh, I'm full of sympathy for all your aspirations. But uh, we need to sacrifice some stuff what do we sacrifice and how do we make it happen, please? <laughs> Can we just take one more question yeah. and then we get it answered uh, while the mic, uh, we need more mics there? Okay, my own microphone. Yes, go ahead. Right, Richard Waldridge, I'm the RIBA Northwest Chair, and I think some more feedback I want to give. Um, we have regional council the other day, and kind of tap into all members in the, uh, in the, in the Northwest. Some of the feedback we're getting is that the three big issues are sustainability and frustration in the fact things aren't going faster than they are at the moment, planning the building regs, and actually come to think about it, all three are linked. And I think one of the big things we would love to see happen is a uh, decluttering of planning and building regulations um, to also assist with delivering sustainable development. And that's something that's sort of really is bugging us because the building regs contradict each other at the moment. In our meeting the other day, and planning wise, um, it's just a case of really getting the legislation to actually help and persuade people to carry a stick approach. So, one thing we cry out for is legislation to be looked at too. So, that's my view, and also the view of our original council. Thank you, Richard. I'm going to come to Wei because you wanted to say something, and then I'll throw it to the whole panel to answer the two questions that you've been asked. Thank you. I, I want to reflect on the um, sustainability and also the um, and also the health issue, because quite often we see sustainability as carbon reduction. But actually, um, based on the research, for example, the public health and also the energy efficiency, they are highly related. Uh, last month, uh, Deluxe they published the um, English Housing Survey 2020 to 2021. It shows, say, um, 3.5 million occupied homes are non-decent homes in terms of their uh, quality. There is a strong correlation between that and the energy efficiency. So within these 3.5 million non-decent homes, 96% of them actually sits in the energy efficiency rating band E to F. This means actually if we want to think about retrofitting our homes, we need to think about alongside how we can improve the livability and the healthy condition of these homes altogether. So, of course, as I said earlier, a healthy population is the most important asset for any nation. So we have to think about if we want to invest, we want to think about retrofitting. We need a aligned strategy with how to think about how to make our living environment much more healthy. So actually this applies to the whole picture, is how we can develop a long-term strategic integrated approach 
to think about sustainability from many different perspectives to make sure actually we have a joint action. And planning plays a key part in that. Because quite often we have a narrow perception of planning, thinking it's about housing delivery or development control even. But actually planning joins all the built environment profession together to have a focused vision to deliver sustainable development based on a much more broader term of sustainability. But at the moment, there's a huge lack of resource in planning profession. So according to our research, there is a net, um, there was net uh, expenditure cut of 43% in the last 10 years. And we are spending only 0.5% net spending in our local authorities on, on planning. And we, we all talk about actually, lots of our discussion today is really about planning, it's how we can make things happen. And it's crucial to make the national planning framework alongside considered with our environmental net gain issues and also with our Climate Act 2008. So only when we can align all these targets framework together can we possibly to create a shared vision and a joined up approach within our sector to achieve something. And more crucially, at the moment, our planning system is a linear system. So we plan things, we build things, but we are not learning enough about what's there and how we can do better for the next time. So it's crucial for us to create a loop system so we can capture all this in information, this data, to make sure actually we know based on the evidence what is our current roadmap or what we are doing and how many percentage we have achieved in terms of carbon reduction. So we can really follow that clearly because at the moment it's a very vague picture. We all say we want to achieve zero carbon, but actually we don't exactly know how much we have achieved. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask one more panelist to comment um, on the two. Um, yes, yeah, Simon. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> the danger of kind of dismissing individual action is I don't doubt the scale of the problem, but when, you, when we all, I went to COP26, I'll be at COP27, when you keep presenting the problem as so overwhelming, it was almost a competition at COP as to who was the worst to therefore be the most important. What you've got to do is, is work on an endless policy of iteration. So I would say now regulations are actually behind best practice, which is a unique moment. But we need the stick and the carrot. We need, we, need to, we need to kind of be pushing all these together. In an optimistic way, I, I do think there's a, a new attitude. You know, the environmental concern used to be a kind of box done at the end by the best. Now it's a kind of globally addressed issue. But what we've got to do is kind of look at bigger pictures and smaller pictures. So on your house, is the retrofit cost going to match the infrastructure costs. If it, you know, because we've tipped as an industry, our, our built environment industry, we've tipped from an obsession with operational energy to a new obsession with embodied carbon because energy's got greener. So there are these strange tipping points that mean that what we thought were the really important orthodoxies have changed quite dramatically. And I still have a slight concern if we don't continuously create critical and open feedback loops that we'll think we've got another solution. So after the war, when we built the Brave New World, the solution was slum clearance, and it was all you know, absolutely good stuff in a terrible you know, era of you know, tuberculosis and poverty on an industrial scale. But then we started talking about housing as units, and hundreds of thousands of units of housing, many of which have failed and have been pulled down and are still being paid for. Um, so we've got to kind of create a We've got to go fast, but we've got to create a really smart and quick feedback loop and learn from different things because orthodoxies, I think, will continue to change. And a lot of, you know, we, we do a lot of work with people like Google. Their view is a lot of the technologies, unless they have a payback, that could be a carbon payback or a financial payback, within five to seven years, they're not even worth doing. So I feel a lot of the things we're looking like, you know, air source heat pumps, will they actually be solving the problem? You know, maybe it's the wind farms and the wave power and a different attitude to retrofitting, which is kind of balancing things out, because we, we will not have as a society endless amounts of money to pour into this. 
and the levelling up thing is absolutely crucial. But there is a danger the carbon debate becomes, you know, brutally a debate for the wealthy because if you're in an underprivileged area, um, it's, it's jobs and the future jobs for your children and education and employment will matter more and 2050 is quite a long time away. So it's a tension for all of us here in this room and way well beyond this room, you know, in more important rooms, to be continuously thinking about. But I think it's about you know, local individual action, people leading the way. It's about people lobbying government. Government, you know, us as an industry coming together to talk to government or future government in a more coherent way and go on the journey. Because otherwise, the kind of the scale of disruption needed will almost overwhelm people. So it's a, it's a, it's a fine balancing act between sort of uh, progress <coughs> and kind of anarchy where we throw it all up in the air and just start again. And that, 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 therein the tension lies. Thank you. We only have time for one more question. Uh, and we've got Paul Eden. Uh, good evening, Phil. Um, it's been really interesting to the panel. Um, can I ask it a completely different way? Um, an action from the individual upwards as opposed to government, local authorities, downwards. There's two pieces of two Nobel Prizes been won on behavioural economics by Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler. Um, I hate to, sorry about this, Rebecca, but um, right honourable MP, and David Cameron's government. And I'm not sorry I mentioned to raise that name. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with Bolsonaro. Anyway, um, he introduced a nudge department. And there was some success with that in terms of pensions, I think, a degree. Um, and I think there's some progress with that, or hopefully some progress on things like organ donation. And that is, how do you nudge people towards doing the right thing? I think Simon's made some really good points here, actually. Let me give you an example. I'll, I'll throw myself in my mercy. I've got type 2 diabetes, and as you can see, I've, I've got a fair amount of timber on me. And I go out walking every day now, 5.30 in the morning, for two hours to try and lose weight. And do you know what really did it for me? Grandchildren. I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And I looked at them and I thought, I want to be around to see them grow up. So that nudged me into a completely different way of living. Now, I'm not saying, look at me, aren't I great? But how do you do that on a population-wide level? To nudge people into different behaviours? Because it's just too easy to say, wag the finger. And say, you know, and constantly use alarmist terms. Climate emergency now. Well, it doesn't become an emergency after 10 years of saying the word emergency. So you have to find a better way of dealing with people on an individual level. And what I'd be interested to know from a potential government, I hope, because uh, I voted Labour on the life, um, but how can we first of all encourage and nudge the people who can afford it to do the right thing? Because if everybody did a little bit, that would make a huge amount of difference. And so, I'm really interested to see what the Labour Party and all these institutions would operate from the ground up as opposed to from the sky down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so can I just ask everybody, 30 seconds, please, oh. to answer that question. 30 seconds, because we don't have much time. Uh, do you want to start, Rebecca? I'll, I'll try and do 30 seconds. <laughs> I think the most important thing to say about all of this is that, and we called it the Green Industrial Revolution in the Labour Party, and Boris Johnson even stole the title. And that's because it wasn't about, and I, I take the point that you made earlier about what do we sacrifice? We've got to sacrifice fossil fuel extraction, it's as simple as that, and become carbon neutral. But this is going to be, if we do it in the right way, the biggest improvement in living standards that many of the people that we live beside have ever seen. And that means making sure that everyone has the ability to take part in that industrial transition. So yeah, if you can afford to get these things done, then that's fantastic. But to do that, you've got to prove to people that, yeah, if you spend money on solar panels or get your home insulated, it'll halve your energy bills. You're going to be saving loads of money. It's going to be amazing. For people who can't afford to pay for those things, you've got to show them 
again, that it's worth their while engaging in this project because it's going to be a huge national project. And then it extends into the new technologies of the future. I mean, there's so many amazing things that are being invented all the way through from the industry stuff that we were talking about, all the way through to curtains that absorb heat during the day and let them out during the night. Films that you can put on your window that act as solar panels. Why can't we have that in our society and improve our living standards? So stop seeing it as a sacrifice, I would say. Stop seeing it as a global catastrophe and see it as the biggest economic opportunity that we've had to improve our lives. Just like we saw in the 1940s and 50s when we saw industry and factory production and just when we saw the computer age in the early 1980s. It's like that, but even better because we're going to be better off physically and mentally and hopefully financially as well if we do it in, a, in an economically just way that redistributes wealth and makes sure that we've got you know, community wealth building right at the heart of it. That's, sorry, that was more than 30 seconds. I was going to say, that was more than 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, you've been quiet. Um, but quick one, education. I certainly as an institute here for the public benefit. And the, the, I take your point about sacrificing the numbers that come out there. The, the one thing that I've seen is, is certainly uh, carbon and, and quants uh, being, being looked at as now uh, a decision making process. And there's lots and lots of simple things, you know, just like clicking down the thermostat a couple of degrees has this effect. Uh, looking at local sourcing, local uh, supply chains, not only has good socio, socio in, uh, impacts and benefits, but it also reduces the, the carbon footprint of deliveries and people to site and things like that. And I, I've done big pieces of work where there's, there's hundreds of thousands of cube uh, taken out of, of uh, schemes purely by doing more work and having it as a consideration. And th those sort of approaches, as, as education becomes, you know, this is, a, this is a forefront subject, people are considering it more and it is, uh, easier to bake it into requirements and contracts and incentivise people but you can also regulate it but it has to be cost, time, you know those two bits but it should be carbon at the front end, what are the decisions we're making around that and my earlier point you know far more in R&D spending. Thank you, uh, Wei I'm going to come back to you, 30 seconds please. <laughs> yeah, I will give you the right shot. <laughs> I, I don't be really believe if we carry on on this, we can make it happen. I think we really need some transform transformative change. On the other hand, we have to really break barriers and also think globally because actually we are not effectively sharing the best practice. So lots of mistakes made in different countries are still being repeated uh, in different places. And also we have to listen to children and youngsters because I think we tend to say, this is what we do. I want to do a bit better, but uh, maybe not 100%. I think we should really have an open heart to think actually how we can transform the whole industry. Thank you. So I think for me, it is about education, but it's about experiential learning. So for me, it's not just about being in school or the classroom and learning about climate change and how we tackle it, but it's about how we as public authorities can demonstrate our commitment to that in terms of what we do, whether that's sustainable drainage systems, tree planting, walking and cycling infrastructure, what we're doing through our housing company, delivering net zero carbon social housing, building a social farm in places like Little Halton. But also it's about working with employers for me. We have something called a carbon literacy consortium in the city of Salford, where employers basically give their employees time to learn about actual climate change and what they need to do or what they may choose to do to actually have a positive impact on the environment and on all of our lives ultimately. But I also think this is about communications, it's about councils, it's about government effectively communicating with the public to galvanise, if you like, behavioural change at the end of the day. What I would say though on nudge theory is we mustn't always see it as someone else's responsibility, i.e. we have to nudge someone else to change their behaviour. We, I think, certainly as, as public officials, have to lead by example and demonstrate why behavioural change is, is critical, really. Thank you. Simon? Yeah, in the 60s, Joan Littlewood, the impresario, made this kind of, had a proposition for, for what she called the fun palace for the people of East London to be built in Stratford. But she said she didn't want to pipe Beethoven down the pits. What she was saying was, you know, paint a much more powerful and engaging vision 
of, you know, I think we'll have to wear more jumpers and we'll all have curtains and the standards of the environment we live in will all have to change because we're going to have to do things. But that, walking is not a bad thing. Travelling in a car might be you know, worse for you than walking. So I, I think we've got to paint a picture that this is actually an engaging and exciting future that we're all going to go on. And yeah, the green revolution that Rebecca's talking about is absolutely vital. Otherwise, anyone who's struggling will not want to go on this trip because it's a, it's a grim religious journey, as my children have been you know, drummed into them. There's not much sense of kind of an engagement and excitement. It's a moral position. And you know, we've got to move on from the moral position into the kind of, this is a wonderful opportunity to help us build another, better, brave new world. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, thank you to the panelists for sharing your insights, for sharing your expertise. Can I just ask everybody, please, just give them a round of applause. Thank you. I also want to thank everybody for accepting our invites, for joining this meeting. It's been fantastic, and the things that have stood out for me really is we all have a job to do, and it's all about collaboration. It's all about working together for the benefit of everybody. In my language, you said it's the spirit of Ubuntu. It's like we're bringing everybody together. We are bringing communities together just to make sure that we benefit for, for the future. I don't think we have a choice. This is something that has to be done. So thank you, and thank you, everybody. Please give yourself a round of applause <laughs> for being here as well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.